Father, you're worthy. We're going to go straight into the word of God. So we just invite you, invite us, we invite ourselves to dine together around the table of God's word. Remember, it's an interactive meeting. I enjoy interacting with people around the table of God. As we break his word, feel free to ask questions or make comments. Just indicate and Mr. Rowe will inform me and I'll take it from there. Amen. So we are still in Revelation. In the day, in this 1230 service, we have been going through the book of John. We're coming close to finishing, right? We have, we have um, 18, 19, 20, 20. We have actually have four chapters left. Left. You have three, you know, and you might end up finishing before the John because they have four, you have three. Um, but maybe not because this chapter 13 has launched us on the platform of looking at the second coming of Jesus Christ, which has complex complexities. And so it takes some time to go through and to explain. So um, we're going to continue until we feel satisfied. No, we're not going to exhaust all the matters of the second coming. We take, we're taking them one by one, piece by piece. Last week we did the, the, the Antichrist, but it was not comprehensive. And um, I want you to know that there are other things that could be shared about the Antichrist. I want to say here, that in the, the manner, the manner in which we do our services, our encounters, can be some a little above some people. And so cell leaders, please make sure you break down the stuff for everybody to ensure that everybody understands everything that we're doing so that everybody can benefit in the name of Jesus. So let's go on now. And now we're going into the whole end time again, and this time is not revelation, I'm sorry, just end time. We are looking to be at the rapture. Sometimes I decide, okay, I'm going to look at something somebody posed, a question or a comment. And the thing is, we take the rapture for granted. I think if there's anything about end time that we take for granted, it's the rapture. In other words, everybody thinks they know exactly what it is, but it's that's not right, really quite correct because I believe there are people in our midst who really don't know what we're talking about. You know, what's rapture? What is this thing? They're not quite clear, but we're just passing by because most of us understand. And so I wanted to go right back to the rapture and to look at what is a rapture. So that's what we'll be doing today. And the scriptures we'll be using primarily, we'll be using John 14, 1, one to three, one to two, thereabouts. We'll be using um, Corinthians, Thessalonians first. Thessalo Thessalonians, is it two, chapter two or chapter four? I think it's chapter four. I'll, look, I'll double check it. And we'll be using first Thessalonians. And we'll be using first Corinthians chapter 15. Just so we don't lose anybody along the way, I'll just check my Thessalonians scriptures as we go along. Um, you think you can pick out the correct one, Mr. Ron, your, sec your second secondary um, monitor? Okay, bro. <laughs> pick out um, where there's two or four for me. I think it's okay. chapter, which, which chapter it is. I kind of lost track of that. But we're beginning at John chapter 14. So let's go there. It's my pastor. Pardon? It, John it chapter John, 14. Huh? Oh, the John chapter 14. Okay. Yes. All right, just, yes, that's it. And we want to begin with verse one. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would, would, I, ha would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. You stop there. We're stopping there. I'm just setting a platform. Go right up back to verse one. Setting a platform for what we're doing. And what I want to do with this platform is just assure you that Jesus is coming back. Right? That's a basic Christian belief. We all must believe. Jesus is coming back. I know sometimes 
it seems so distant. We have read of so many dates that have been set. We ourselves may have waited, but he is coming back. So I wanted to, to set this platform from this scripture and we could even go to the ascension and look at the ascension. In fact, it might be a valuable scripture to look at uh, when Jesus ascended into heaven and to look at that, that account as well, just to reassure ourselves because we have to make sure we understand he is coming back. That's a foundation truth of our faith. I don't know. Is it possible to be a Christian without believing in the second return of Jesus Christ? It is so fundamental to what we're about. So let's look at the ascension scripture. When Jesus ascended into heaven. One of the gospels. Well, this is from which gospel? This is from? This is from Luke. This is, a, this is a very excellent example of how different scriptures will align with other scriptures. No, I, I, this, is, this is where we can all study together because there's one that says, the same way in which you see him go up is either in one of the gospels or the book of Acts, first chapter. Yes, Acts. But this, this, we can still read it. But all this does is tell that he went up. But there's another one that says the same way he went up is the same way he's coming again. Which is this, Ascension? Yes, it yes might in be Acts. Yeah. Right, let's read this one. Where is this found? In Acts first. Acts right, 1, 1, right, yes. All right, let us read from a reasonable place. All right, let's, let's read this. Because you see, to me, the knowledge of the word is so critical. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You all know that story. You all know that that is the cardinal thing that the Jews are waiting for, right? And in a sense, we are waiting for it too, right? Because the truth is the full restoration of Israel will, will happen at the second coming, right? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and the cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Then suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is a very important scripture on the second return of Jesus Christ. Why is it important? It's important because one, it assures us that he's coming back. And two, it tells us that he's not going to come back in, in a very secretive way. He's not coming back as a baby for one. So if anybody says this is the Christ and they were born, this is not the Christ. So he's not coming back as a baby, right? He's coming back just like he left. He's coming back out of the sky with glory this time, right? I guarantee you with more glory that even is ascension. And so we can use that as a major sign in understanding the true Christ when he comes, that he's coming back in full glory. Amen. But there's something else I want to point out in the scripture, a little further up. Go back to the start, I'll tell you where. It says, they gathered, right? Um, he says, it's not the time to know. But when they asked Jesus about the timing, 
I want to highlight something here, which is kind of an aside, but still valid, very important. But you will, you will receive power. So instead of going into a long dialogue with them about when he's coming back, in this particular instance, he decided to say to them, listen, basically it's not for you to know, but you will receive power. He was more concerned with the fact that there's an interim period. So what he's really saying here is there's an interim period <clears throat> between now and when I come back. And you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you and he tells them you'll be witnesses. And he tells them in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So basically he was asking if the gospel will preach to the end of, ends of the world, end of the earth, sorry ends of the earth, he was saying it will be. The power will come through the Holy Spirit and you will do it, right? I like that little interim. So there's an interim and we cannot underestimate that interim. That interim is what we're now living in. It's the interim of the power of the Holy Ghost and of the preach of the gospel, <clears throat> excuse me, and of the formation of the church of God. So now we are going to go right to our Thessalonian scripture. All right, we're going to read from verse 13, chapter 4. He said, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to, want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So here again, he's dealing with a second return. And, and I want you to notice the word with. Because what the Bible teaches is that when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring a whole entourage. He's bringing a whole army, right? So he's going to bring them back with him, right? Now, regardless of when you think the rapture will be, and by the way, let me, before I go further, tell you what the rapture actually is. The rapture, for those who do not know, is the snatching away of the believer's that means the believers are going to be taken out of the earth. The people are dead already at the, at, the, at, the, at the time of the rapture. They are going to, the graves are going to open up and they're going to come out of their graves. But they're not going to come out like ghosts. They are going to come out of the graves with new reformed bodies. God is going to rebuild their bodies into a, and change it into a glorious body. And they're going to rise to meet Jesus in the air. And the ones who are alive at the same time are going to be taken and they're going to be changed as well into this new body. That's what the rapture is. And they're going to take, be taken up to be with Christ. As we have said in the previous meeting, there are different beliefs in terms of when the rapture will occur. There are some persons who believe the rapture will come before the tribulation period. There are some that, that believe it will come in the middle. Some that believe it will come just before the end. And some that believe it will come after. You have all different types of belief. And we've been through that. So I just want to, to um, define it here and to say that when we're taken up to be with the Lord, we're coming back with him to the earth. We're coming back to the to the earth with him to finish a certain work that he has to do. So he says, he says here, if I read from 14 again, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, word we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. I'd like to say here too that one of the reasons that Jesus and the word of God outside of Jesus' own word 
teach about the second coming is to give believers hope. In the John scripture, John 14, you heard the words, comfort, take comfort. Here again, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Thessalonians, is trying to give comfort. So he's saying, don't be afraid. And we likewise must take comfort, right? The loved ones who died in Christ, and I want to say here, in Christ, because we have a habit of, after persons have died, we do what I call sanitizing their image. That is, we try to make them sound right and holy and great. That's what we try to do, right? So we make them at the funeral sound like they were great people. When in fact, deep in our hearts, we knew they were very, very bad people. And they did not accept Jesus Christ. And even if they were good in the sense of the world, is, in the world and how the world assesses goodness, they may not have done what the word of God says they should do by accepting Jesus Christ, by receiving him as the living savior. So they stayed outside of the fold of Jesus, all right? But we try to suddenly make them into people who have gone to heaven and who are doing extremely well. Pastor, no, we have two questions here. Go right ahead. Let me hear them. First is Kevin Palmer and then Ebony. Sullivan. Yes, Kevin. Kevin from Campus Cell. I don't remember my last name, but I remember you were in the meeting this morning. Go right ahead with your question. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, my brother. Um, so my question is, because of what is being said here, um, this would mean that everyone who have died in the past, that would mean that everyone is asleep at this moment and no one is in heaven as yet. Am I correct? Okay. Um, you have raised <laughs> a very complex question, you know, because there, when you die, your body goes into the ground. Am I right or wrong? Correct. Correct. But... Your consciousness does not, your spirit is not locked in that casket, right? But I, I, I'm going to use my words very guardedly. In a sense, we become without a body, so to speak, right? And so we go to a place that God has prepared for us. If you're righteous, right? If you're righteous. You go to another place if you're not. But the final judgment, and that is one of the topics that we love to cover. That's why I'm saying I don't know when I'll be able to leave this because each time we, we teach something, something else opens. Because the truth is you cannot teach it end time and not discuss the judgments, plural, because there are various judgments that come in the end, right? So your, your spirit, do you realize, Kevin, your spirit being really, you know, your spirit being fundamentally? So the truth is no person who has ever lived can die. I want to say die, become disseminated, non-existent. Your spirit being, and the spirit doesn't die like the body does, right? So what the Bible says, when the rapture occurs, and by the way, the word rapture is not in the Bible, right? Per se, it is just called snatching away or however they choose to translate it. What the Bible says is that your body will be res resurrected and made new and will join with your, your, your conscious being again, join with your, your spirit and soul, right? So everybody who is in the first resurrection, as the Bible calls it, this is what's going to happen to them, right? So there is a place prepared for those who die in Christ. And here I want to say something that heaven is an extremely complex place. Let me give you a little analogy. <clears throat> Earth is a very complex place. Not every country looks alike, right? You have Sweden, you have, you have Kenya, you have Trinidad, you have so many parts of the Earth. You have mountains like Mount Everest, you have forest, you have the Amazon forest with all kinds of wild, wild animals. You have the center of the Earth with a mantle in it and hot lava. So the Earth is a complex place. Heaven is even more complex. And God has reserved a place. It, you remember the thief on the cross? You, uh, you know that story, Kevin? That Jesus was yes, crucified yes. between two thieves? Yes, yes. And one of them accepted the fact that this was the Christ. 
And he says, today you shall be in paradise with me. So there is a place reserved for those who die in Christ. But that, that fulsome heaven experience, I believe you're, you're ushered into that in a gradual way and, until, and also after a certain type of judgment, right? The fulsome experience. I, oh, I would try to use an earthly analogy is yes, you go to heaven in a sense, but there is still dim dimensions that you might not have access to until a certain point of history. May, may I, have I answered the question? Yes, in a sense, yes. Yeah, in a sense, and, and it's complex, and I, re I respect that. And when we teach on the judgment and heaven, because we can look at heaven, then maybe we'll be able to explain a little bit more better. Right? And then you yes, can see you some of your questions answered. All right? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yes. The second question. And then um, it was similar to the question he just asked. So it's pretty much, I understand it now. And I'm also wondering if... Who is this? This is Emily. Okay, go ahead. I'm also wondering if it links somewhat to... Your mic, your, your audio, I can barely hear you. I'm very sorry. Are you able to hear now? Better. 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 Yes. Um, I was just saying that I'm also wondering if us not getting that spiritual body then, as you have said, that new body rather, as you have said, I'm in a new as you have said, is linked to the scripture where God says that um, we will be like the angels in heaven. Where he no, said, no, no, no. Not again. You said us not getting it? You said we wouldn't get it right away as we die. No, because you're, you're in the grave. Your body's in the grave. There's a timing. Okay. There's a timing. And so the reason for us not having that new body yet is because there's a timing. I, I remember saying to you one week that God does things in his own timing and his, in his own his own phases. And we might have, we might even wonder why doesn't God just end this whole thing? Why didn't he end it in the Garden of Eden? But he has his own approach, right? So his approach on the matter of death means that we'll be reunited with our body at a specific time. He has just chosen that way, right? Now, Listen, it's a very complex topic, and guess what? Let me tell you something. There are also different viewpoints on it, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to explore the different viewpoints for you so that you get a thorough knowledge of what we're saying because there are all kinds of viewpoints, and what we try to do, I try not to be as conclusive as many people are, right? I try to present different views and say, okay, this is what they believe. As long as they are within what I call scriptural possibility. I'm not going to share anything which is outlandish against scripture, but as long as they're within scriptural possibility, I have no problem with sharing it. But this is a different thing from the angelic existence, right? Okay, Pastor Henry. Right, uh-huh. Any other question now? Or we go, we'll go on and then we we'll ask. So let me go on. Pastor Helen. Yes. Good um, day. I have a question. This is right Alexander. All right. So that new body that we will... All right. The, the Bible said that um, God will create a new heaven and a new heaven and a new earth. Here is what. Here's what. Let me go into Corinthians regarding the new body. Because when I go there, it describes it a little better. Okay, me. Right? Um, but the new heaven and the new earth is another thing, a different thing from your new body. But let's go into Corinthians first, and you'll see more. So let's finish Thessalonians. All right. 15. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. I love that word command. It's something he's going to order. Ooh. If you read in, in uh, the story of Lazarus, remember when he was raising Lazarus from the dead? No, this is different. Let me explain the difference. Lazarus, when he was raised from the dead, came back with a human body, just like this one. 
So his body was put back together, healed and delivered, but it was still the human body. But the resurrection body that we'll get will be a body fit to live in eternity, fit to live in the supernatural. And I'm going to be explaining that more to you, right? Um, but yet, what I want to point out about the Lazarus experience, do you remember when Jesus called Lazarus from the grave? It, maybe we can look at it. When he called him, it was with a commanding voice. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And so I love the scripture that says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. Because this is the almighty God. This is the Christ. And he's commanding all the dead bodies to come up. He says in verse 43, which book is this? Though? Book and chapter. This is John 11. John 11, 43. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. So that, that command that God has over death will come to a max. This will be nothing compared to when he calls from the tomb, when he commands life from all the tombs, the, 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 the believers. Let us, let us go back to our scripture. When Jesus comes, he's going to call the believers out of the tomb. This is called the first resurrection. He's going to call them out of the tomb with a command. And the Bible says the graves will give up the dead. It will not be able to keep them there. Right? Now let me help you a little further. Jesus, and we can probably look up that scripture, not this minute. Look it up and put it aside. Um, Jesus is called the first fruit. The first fruit of resurrection. The first fruit of resurrection. He is the first one to do this thing that is going to happen to the believers. So he's the, like the forerunner of this thing that God plans to do, right? Um, and so when we look at Jesus' body, which I think we should look at, we will understand what kind of body the believer is going to get. So let me finish these scriptures, look at Corinthians, and then we look a little at Jesus' body that he had, right? All right, so I'm now at verse 16, I think. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's a rapture. Caught up means rapture, right? We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. These words should be encouraging us, brethren. It should be, I should be, it should encourage us towards holiness, towards living a Christ-like life. Because that, come on. What greater promise can God give humanity? If you believe in me, this is what's going to happen to you. Death will have no jurisdiction over you. There'll be, it will not hold you down. We sing the songs, no grave can hold my body down. But this is what it's speaking about. It's not just a nice tune and a nice jumpy song. It's a reality. This is a promise of God. Oh, I wish we could see it. Because it takes spiritual eyes to appreciate a promise like this. This is eternal life. This is what God is saying. He said, you, you will not remain in the grave. In fact, in Thessalonians, Paul is saying, listen, guys, I know you feel sad about those who have died in Christ, but don't feel sad because look here. This is what's going to happen to them and to you. We should be the happiest people on the planet. Nothing should face us, not even death. That's why Paul, even Paul who wrote this book, when he was headed towards Jerusalem, Paul, sorry, towards Rome, Paul did not have to go to Rome, right? There are certain things, if he had done them differently, he wouldn't have had to end up in Rome. For example, he ended up in Rome because he appealed to Caesar. He didn't have to appeal to Caesar. He could have ended his trial, for those who don't know, he was on a trial for some really weird trumped up charges. 
But if he had not appealed to Caesar, he wouldn't have to go to Rome. The other governmental officers at lower ranks could have settled the case, but he appealed to Caesar. And there was a prophet called Agabus. And Ag Agabus received a prophetic word from God, a true prophetic word, by the way. He tied up his hands and he said, the person to whom this, this sash or this belt belongs, they shall be bound, etc., etc." Basically, I think he actually predicted death for anybody, for Paul or for whoever it belonged to. You can find the book of, book of Acts, look up Agabus for me so I can make sure I'm accurate. And yet, in spite of hearing that word, Paul continued on to Rome because these men were not afraid to die. They truly believe this promise. Now, my question is, do you truly believe this promise? Because there are lots of Christians who really and truly deep inside, they don't believe this promise. Did you find the Agabus scripture? All right, just give me the reference. Um, it's Acts chapter what? It's Acts 21. All right, verse 10. All right. It says, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm, I'm already not only, I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he, when he would not be dissuaded, he, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. No, sorry, it was Jerusalem in this case that this prophecy was made over, but he did go to Rome and he didn't have to. If he, if he had not appealed to Caesar, he would not have had to go to Rome and Rome is where he met his death, right? So brethren, these people were not afraid to die. And you know what I wanna pray for all of us today? Everybody within the hearing of my voice, that the fear of death will depart from us in the name of Jesus. In fact, one of the reasons why Jesus died was to take away the fear of death. But the truth is, the average Christian is extremely scared of death anyway. And the devil still plays on our minds. The truth is we're being transitioned. In other words, our minds are being transformed into the word of God. And so I can understand when we have not yet reached a place, but we should be striving after that place when we are not afraid of death and we're not afraid to suffer for Christ. It's very, very important. Christians are born to die. And some of us will have to die physically. Some of us won't. Probably most of us, maybe none of us, but definitely we have to die to self. Amen. For Christ. So we're here. And this is, is a scripture of comfort. So you can go now over into our Corinthian scripture. Pastor, we have a question from the yes, go ahead. service. Go ahead. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't really a question, but when you had mentioned that as believers we should be, we should begin to free ourselves from the fear of death. Mm -hmm. I was reminded. I'm going through Revelations, and I was reminded that in chapter two, when the church, the letter to the church in Smyrna, interestingly, when when the Lord was introducing himself to them in that letter. He said, look, and the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. And then in verse 10, it says, do not be afraid about what you're to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer for perse um, suffer persecution. And then it says, be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. And when I was reading that verse earlier this week, I was very encouraged by the Lord just reminding me that, you know, you really, as you said, you signed up for this, you know, be, dying for Christ is a part of accepting Christ mm -hmm. into your heart. But the Lord is the giver of life. He is the first, the first fruit of the resurrected, right? And so we should rest in that comfort Amen. because we know who we serve. Praise be to God. Indeed, indeed, and thank you so much. 
We're, we're not Corinthians. In fact, um, no, I'm so sorry. Go right back to Thessalonians. You see this Bible? Bibles were never divided divide into chapters and verses until later. And so you can, this, this, this course actually continues into chapter 5. So we have not finished reading it. Four, and then you go right down into five. Right. And it continues. It says, no, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well. No, it's amazing how many times God, the Bible has told us that. That God will not be re revealing the specific date and time. Right? So it says, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Now listen to me. As we read down, you're going to discover something. You're going to discover that when he says it will come like a thief in the night, it will be on those who are not watching. We who should be alert and should be watchful the day of the Lord will not come like a thief in the night. A thief in the night means it's going to catch us while we're sleeping. It's going to catch us unawares, right? We're not going to be like that because we are encouraged by the scriptures to be watchful, to be sober, and to be praying. That's what the Bible encourages true believers to be doing. Now, I want to point out something here. That is why we cannot be caught up in the affairs of this world. That's why we must be careful when ungodly people have our ears and our eyes. Why? Because they are going to be caught unawares. They are not watching for what you and I are watching. So they are going to be going about their business, doing their things, not as watchful, sober, vigilant people of God, but as those caught up in dissipation. Meaning their, their, their senses, their, their faculties are dissipating across many interests. It's distracting. It's not focused on God. So if we live in the realm where we are immersed in them, we are immersed in their culture, in their thought thoughts, in how they live, then we too will lose our watchfulness or alertness and it will come upon us like a thief in the night. But let's read on and see what God says. Verse 4. And you notice it like a woman. Listen, let me just stress one other thing before you move on. Verse 3. It says, suddenly as, a, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they'll not escape. And let me tell you. You see, labor pains on a pregnant woman? When a woman is going to have a baby, she can't tell exactly when the labor pains are going to start. Right, we're not talking about induced labor, the natural process. She cannot tell. You'll be just there happily watching a, a movie and boom, there's a contraction. Woo! Wow. And the, the labor pains begin. That's the first thing I want to point out to you. Right? The second thing is that once labor begins, contractions increase over time. So what it used to be so when it starts, it might be 30 minutes apart, 15, whatever it is, and it's going to increase to 10 minutes, then five minutes, then two minutes as you go along, right? So you take those two truths out of that. Verse four, but you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. That's why we, we sit here over the word in the evenings, that's why we teach the word. You should avail yourself of the word so you're sharp, right? You're, you're, you're really sharp, your faculties, your spiritual senses. Verse five, you are all children of the light. Right, let me help me back with my spot as you move the screen, <laughs> right? Amen. Thank you so much. You are all children of the light and children of day. 
we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. I want you to move back up a little for me. There's a line there I want to speak on. Where it speaks, not, maybe I've gone up too far. Um, right, yes, verse nine. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Now, a lot of persons use this to say that that is why they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, let me make something plain. A lot of very solid Bible scholars believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. There are others, though, who say the tribulation, and this is a fact, the tribulation is divided two, three and a half year periods. We mentioned that last year, last week, sorry. So there are lots of others who say the second half of the tribulation is called the wrath of God. And so they use the scripture to say, yes, is going to come before the second half, but not at the beginning, right? I try to give you all these perspectives, you know, because I want you to be knowledgeable, right? You ask me, what, when will, why do I think it will come? I really honestly don't know, right? But I want to teach you everything that I can. And what I can tell you, it will come, that much I'm sure about, that there will be a snatching away of God's people, right? And so when it is positioned, I really can't conclusively say. Amen. So that's one thing I wanted to comment, comment on. Right. There are other things, but we won't comment today, like the encouragement to have, to have on the love as a breastplate and hope of salvation as a helmet. But another time we can. Let's go over into Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All right. The resurrection of Christ. No, brothers and sisters, I want you. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. It says, "If you hold firmly." There's something I'd like to point out to you here that there are many Christians who say that once you are saved, you cannot be lost. So you 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 are forever once I, once you accept the Lord. There are other Christians that say you must endure to the end or you will be lost. I believe that maybe how they both look at it is from different angles. The truth is, is if you truly accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's very difficult for your salvation to be lost. But the truth also is that if you truly accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will not be walking in an arbitrary way. You'll be fired up to live a holy and a pure and a true life, right? So people are walking all over the place, um, arbitrarily sinning, living in sin without any, any real um, contrition and brokenness about it. One wonders, did they ever really meet the Lord? We don't know. But the thing is, the scripture says, you must endure to the end. That's what you and I need to know. And hopefully we all will. Right? By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse four, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas 
and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. That, that means at the time of writing, they're still living. Though some have fallen asleep, meaning died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, right? So he's given a list of the credentials that prove that Jesus was raised from the dead. I don't think you can be a Christian without the faith in Jesus Christ that he died, was resurrected, and ascended. These are cardinal, cardinal truths. In fact, there are some other cardinal truths. You must believe that he came born of a supernatural power. That means he was not born of human flesh. He was born of the spirit of God through a virgin birth. That he lived, that he is the Messiah, that he was crucified, he died, he was resurrected, he ascended, and he's coming back again. These are, these are the foundations of the scriptural belief of our faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 9, for I am the least of all the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I'm what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. All right, let's move down to 12 now. By the way, this book was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. But what normally happened in the early, early church is that once the Corinthians read the letter, they might circulate it to other churches. So this was the way the gospel went around in those days. But, verse 12, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say, that there is no resurrection of the dead. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised, right? No, a lot of the Jews did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, while some others did. And it seems to have carried over into the Gentile church. So he's addressing the issue. 14, let me read again. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised, sorry. Yes, that's correct. More than that, more than, more, more than that, we, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Can you imagine that? If, if That is like taking out the pillar of the faith of Jesus Christ. And if that is taken out, then what do we have? That means that great hope that I pointed out to you earlier, that we will be taken out of our graves and snatched away if we are alive and given this new body, all that will be fiction. And if it's fiction, then why are you even here? Why are you in church? Why are you trying to live holy? Let's go on. Verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. That means that's it, kaput, them done. They're disseminated. They'll never come back to life ever. There's no eternal life. If only for this life, this life here now, we have hope in Christ, we have all people most repeated. What Paul is saying if what I accepted Jesus for, what I came into Christian faith for, is just this, 
then uh, come on now, this is not worth it. Let's face it, it's true. If if I watch people all the time, you know, and I watch them stumbling around in life, they might jump out of a car. Oh boy. I was at the tire place, I think it was Friday, and this man jumped out of his Jaguar. I didn't even know it was a Jaguar. It's after I sat there a while I noticed. And he, you know, I said, you look at them and all their pride is in that Jaguar. Because he doesn't look different from anybody else. He's an honor man, probably about 50. He doesn't know it's their hour of death. He probably has had many sorrows, many disappointed disappointments. Huh? So what is life about if it's just to be able to own a Jaguar? If it's only to get a PhD at university, if it's only to buy some pretty clothes or get a handsome husband or a beautiful wife, in a few years it's over. I know sometimes when you're young you think life is forever, but as you progress in life you realize how very short it is. So by the time you reach my stage, you just realize life ends so quickly and there's so many sorrows in it. So Paul is saying, if this is if what we have believed is for this life only, we have all creatures to be pitied. I'll read again, verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead comes through, also comes through a man. So here's what he said. The one man he mentioned is Adam. And that one man, Adam, was, I don't want to get into the theology of Adam, but Adam can either be the name of the individual in Genesis or it is a synonym for mankind, right? In this case, he's talking about mankind. So death came through the sin of Adam, sin of mankind, as, it was, as he represented mankind in the Garden of Eden. And as he sinned, sinned Death came into the world, a lot of death, you know, spiritual death, but also physical death. Adam was not designed to die. God did not design Adam and Eve to die. No. It was when they sinned that death came into the earth and bit them. And so from that time on, people had a lifespan. And in those days, they lived till 900 and something and 800 and something. And when you read the scriptures gradually, it came down until nowadays. So people have to even live to 55. By the way, for those who do not know, TB Joshua died. You people were aware of it? This, this African preacher? No, we didn't. Yes, we found out today. I saw it on YouTube. Yeah, he on died, died when? Yeah. Recently, like Friday? Maybe. I don't know which day, but he died very recently. He was 57 years old. So let's look at it. I mean, Adam and those people lived 900 odd years. But they were never designed to die at all. It's through sin that death got its power, right? And through, through this one man, the human representative of mankind, Adam, he sinned, he died, all die. So we know are sentenced to death almost. We, nobody lives eternally. As much money as you have, um, Whatever you do, I see people freezing their bodies, literally freezing their bodies, waiting for some cure for death to come. You know that? You pay money. You pay money to be frozen, waiting on a cure for death. You, you're, you're aware of the fact that that exists, everybody? Yeah, you have to be very rich. So when you die, they have a process of freezing you and they keep you in a place. It's big, big money. Big money, believe me. And they're waiting till there's a cure for death so they can, they can be taken out of that frozen state and brought back to life. It's a literal thing, no fiction. It's not science fiction. This is for real. If they'll ask me, I've told them the cure for death. Right? And I've told them there is a cure for death. And that's what we're reading about now. 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Right? So what Christ did, he reversed the curse of death. Both the spiritual death, because I remember I said when Adam died, there was a spiritual death. And spiritual death really means separation from God. But there was also the law of physical death that came into being, right? 
And so everything in, in the earth is subject to death and decay, right? But when the second Adam came, who is the Christ, the Messiah, he reversed both. One, he made a way for us to come back into unity with God. So we now had life. Because in the same way in which spiritual death means separation from God, Spiritual life means we come back into union with God, right? So we come one with God again. Our spirits become one with God and we get life in us now. That's what eternal life is about. It's a part of it, right? So Christ, when he died, he won back life for us. This life that we call the, the spiritual aspects of it. And he also gained victory over death. No, you might say, but but people are still dying. I mean, every day Christians, everybody dies. Yes, because there is an appointed time when he's going to display his victory over death. He's going to make that great command. Remember that command we read about? So he has chosen not to just give Christians immediately this power over physical death, but rather he's waiting for one Big showdown. One big showdown when at, at, at a command, all those who are dead in Christ will be resurrected to life. Victory over death, physical death will be displayed. And all the, those who are alive and are subject to the decay of this earth will now come back as well, right? Right? They will get this new body. They will have had victory over death. You know, even while you live in this natural life, you're subject to decay. You know, I mean, when you reach by, you know, you, you say, wow, there's such there's an ache here. There's a little ache there. This morning I got up and I felt like I'd done some exercise. I did not go exercise on Friday. I did not go on Saturday. So I know it's not exercise pain. So I had to work on the pain, you know, drink a little coffee for some energy and, and make sure I get some vitamin C and everything to prep up myself for the service because my body is subject to decay, right? Whether you like it or not, when you're 50, you don't look like when you're 16. Your body is now subject to decay, right? And everything is. If you get a car and the car was a, a 1993 car, believe me, it will have had multiple changes of parts. If you buy a tire, that tire is going to wear down. Earth is subjected to decay. But the Christ has come. 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn. Right? Remember I told you God has his own order, his own way of doing things. Christ the first fruits. And he came back to life 2,000 years ago, approximately. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, that's the next step. When he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under Mr. Rowe. Yes, Pastor. You need to move this thing up. Oh, Where are you? Sorry. I'm reading 27 now. Okay. Put 27 at the top, please. Right? All right. For he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. When he has done this, then the son himself will be made subject to him who puts everything under him. I always love this scripture. And I've been meditating on the unity of God. It's perfect alignment in our earlier service. We've spoken about them probably two weeks straight because we're looking at John chapter 17, where the Lord speaks about the oneness and the unity of what we call the Godhead. And it's perfect unity. There's absolutely nothing out of sync, nothing, no one upmanship, nothing. They are just moving in perfect unity. 
And you see it displayed here again, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Perfect unity. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those who do, sorry, now if there's no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? Well, this is not a common, this is not a practice in our modern churches. I've never personally known any church that baptizes dead people. But it seems in the early church, there was that pra practice where after a person had died, if they were Christians before, you know, and they never had the opportunity to be, to be baptized, they'd have done it, right? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than, than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, please move up. <clears throat> let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. So if the dead are not raised, Paul says, let's have a party. Let's do what we want. Let's have six wives and four husbands. Let us eat as large amount of food. Let us fly all over the world. Let us make the most money we can. Because this life will become our only hope. But thank God this is not so. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. So what was happening in the Corinthians church and in the Thessalonians church is that they had gained erroneous ideas about the second coming. And some of them believed all kinds of things. Some believed it had happened already. Some believed it was never going to happen. Some believed there was no resurrection of the dead. And so in these various letters, Paul was addressing all these various errors. Let's go down to 35. <clears throat> but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? These are some of the questions we heard earlier. How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. So what he's saying, if you plant a, a, a pea grain and you water that pea grain, when it just starts to bud, and you, if you dig it up and look at it, it doesn't look like how you planted it. The skin would have been stripping off. It would have swollen bigger. It certainly looks very weird compared to the, the, the seed you planted. So he's saying that's death. And as the thing, as the tree comes bigger, the pea, the pea, pea plant gets bigger as it grows. Nothing is left of the seed you planted eventually, right? So he's saying if even nature shows you that the body you come with is not the same one with which you were, with which you were planted. Because that corn stalk, for example, doesn't look any like the corn grain you sowed. It's a new body, yet it's the same corn grain, right? So he's trying to use nature to teach them. Verse 37, when you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat, or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives his own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh. Animals have another. Birds another. Fish another. <coughs> Excuse me. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars to get another. And stars differ from stars in splendor. So Paul is trying to paint the picture of the greatness of God's creative genius. And he said, don't limit your mind. Try, try and focus. God can do anything God wants, right? Verse 42, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sold, sold is perishable. It is raised imperishable. 
So if perishable, it goes into the soil, or if it's burned in some countries, burned. But when it comes out, it comes out imperishable on the day of resurrection. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, which is the Christ, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who, who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. And that's speaking of Christ. How many verses I left? All right, 58. All right, let's go through those quickly. Where are we at? Verse 50? Right, just go up. Move it up to the top, please. Verse 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So your earthly self cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you, a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in the flash, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Verse 54, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the, say, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Right? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But well, thanks be to God, he gave us the victory through the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen and amen. Now, I'm open to questions. Let me just say here that I'm not going to go through the scriptures with Jesus. But just to say that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, you could see him. But at the same time, he could walk through walls. And at the same time, while he could walk through walls, when Thomas says, I will not believe unless I see those scars in his hands, he invited him to come and put his hands and feel them. And he did, he put his hand in a wound, right? So this was a kind of body, it was a very supernatural body. He could eat because he was he ate fish with his disciples, right? So he could eat, but it was supernatural. He could walk through walls. He could also appear in a place like suddenly, right? Suddenly he'd just be there, right? Translated, mom, right? So this body, while it could function in the natural, it could function almost like a regular body. At the same time, it had great supernatural functions. And eventually, that same body ascended into heaven. That new body, not the old one. And he is a first fruit. So we're going to have a body like his. The Bible tells us clearly. All right? So are there questions now? No questions? Everybody has everything answered? Pastor Helen. Go ahead, yes. Pastor Morris. Go right ahead. Hey, would you say that the ascension into heaven was like a first fruit of the church that is going to ascend to heaven in the rapture? Well, it does show us the power that God has to do it. And yes, in a sense, yes. 
You know, and they, but remember, there are others before Jesus that did it. Remember, Elijah, God did it to Elijah, even though was, he did it in a chariot with fire. Uh, I think fire was there. Enoch, yeah. Enoch yeah. was taken up. So God has periodically done it. And in fact, in the in the in the in the tribulation, the two witnesses are caught up into heaven. Right, right. So, so um, there are actually some people who believe. No, I don't want to complicate people's minds. But there are some people who believe that the rapture will not just be one event, but it will take place periodically throughout a period of time. So, for instance, some people believe, okay, let me say, let's face it. If the rapture is before the tribulation, it will be the rapture of those who are walking right with Christ. Let's face it. It has to be those people. It has to be those who are clean, who have their robes washed, they're ready, they're waiting. So he'll take them up. But there could be other believers who through the, the start of tribulation, um, they come to their senses, they repent, right? So what happens to them? Eh? You follow what I'm saying? I don't want to show anything here. I just open your mind to think um, about the whole experience and to study the scriptures and not to be bogged down. Let me say this in, in, in closing that, and I'm still open to a, a couple of questions. That there are some people that if you don't believe exactly like they believe concerning the rapture, like you, 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 you say, well, okay, maybe it is a pre-tribulation rapture, but maybe it's a myth. They actually will think you're not a believer, which is absolutely ridiculous. But we thank God for churches all over the world now that are coming to, to discard those ugly behaviors that cannot understand. This is not a part of the tree trunk or the root. These are branches. And, and so there are good Bible people who believe that it comes in the middle. There are good Bible people who believe it comes at the start. God is not perturbed by that kind of, 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 of thing where we, we're so impatient and proud and dogmatic that we don't even give a listening ear. And both of them present scriptures, by the way. Amen. Any other question? Praise God. So I take it we all perfectly understand. I'm going to invite you over this week to look at how Jesus' um, post-resurrection body functioned and just inform yourself because it's your promise if you walk right with God. Amen and amen. So we're going to have our closing song. Thanks for listening. <laughs>